My name is Takashi Bauchi from University of Tokyo. And today I'm going to talk about BCS-BC crossover in iron, selenium, sulfur superconductors. And I, I'm going to show you our very recent unpublished results, which are quite surprising. So this work has been done in collaboration with many people listed here. And this is the uh, people in my group, and this is the people in the Yuji Matsuda's group, University of Ky Kyoto University. And we have collaboration with the KIT group and uh, uh, Professor Shin's group, who does the laser RPS technique, and STM by Hanaguri-san, and theory inputs from Ilya Eremin. And the uh, uh, main players here is Yuta Mizukami and Ohei Tanaka in my group, and uh, Dr. Hashimoto in Shin's lab. OK, so let me start with a very brief introduction on bcs bc crossover. And this is a kind of general phase diagram. So this is temperature divided by the Fermi temperature. So we consider the Fermi system. And this is the strength of attraction. So you have a weak coupling limit, which is here, and strong coupling limit, which is here. And in the weak coupling uh, limit is, of course, is the BCS limit. So we have a, a pair size, which is actually the uh, coherence strength, is much larger than the inter-electron distance, which is of the order of 1 over Kf. So you have a situation that Kf xi is much larger than unity, right? And in the uh, opposite side, you have a so-called Bose-Einstein condensation limit. So you have a very strong interaction between these two uh, fermions. So you can actually have a, a tightly bound molecules like this. So your pair size is now becoming much smaller than Kf inverse. So you have a situation that Kf xi is much smaller than unity. And what is important here is that there is no uh, phase transition between these two limits. So you have just a crossover phenomena. And most interesting regime is the so-called uh, crossover regime where you have a strongly interacting pairs, and the pair size of, is of the order of 1 over Kf. So you have the situation that Kf xi is of the order of unity. Now here is the uh, important parameter, which is actually uh, the ratio between the superconducting gap delta and the Fermi energy Ef. And this ratio is actually is the, of the order of 1 over xi Kf. And let's suppose you have a single band, and you have a only whole band uh, given by this red curve in the normal state. Then if you go into the superconducting state, what happens in the BCS limit is, as you know, you have a gap opening at the uh, Fermi uh, wave vector Kf. So you have a minimum gap at Kf, of course. And then, you, then if you do, for example, RPS measurements, you can see this kind of uh, band structure in the superconducting state. But in the opposite side, what happens is that you will have a negative chemical potential. Then the gap opening occurs at k equals 0, not at kf. So you have a minimum gap uh, here at k equals 0, at the gamma point. And in the conventional superconductors, the, this ratio delta over EF is very small, like 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So you are uh, in this limit, of course. And in some of the uh, underdoped high TC cuprates, this ratio becomes larger. And this is like 10 to the minus 1 and minus 3. And so there is a strong discussion about the uh, relevance of this BCS BC crossover in the physics of underdoped high TC cuprates. So today, I would like to focus on the, uh, this system, iron selenium, and in this context of vcs vc crossover. And uh, uh, as you know, th this material is very important material. And first of all, the uh, crystal structure is quite simple. So you, you have only iron selenium layers like this. And there are a number of uh, you know, uh, interesting features. So the physics is very rich. First of all, you have a structural transition at 90 Kelvin, which is here in this, uh, in this uh, low T curve. You can see a kink here. 
and you don't see any magnetic ordering down to lowest temperatures. So here you have only uh, uh, in-plane anisotropy with, without magnetism. So people call this state as a non-magnetic nematic phase. And for example, if you look at the vortices in the superconducting state, you can see a very elongated shape, which is the uh, kind of uh, uh, evidence for the strong anisotropy, strong in-plane anisotropy uh, in this nematic phase. And uh, what is uh, interesting here is that we have the so-called compensated semi-metallic uh, electric structure, meaning that we have uh, uh, equal numbers of electrons and holes in the system. And most importantly, we have very small Fermi energies. And we can obtain a very uh, beautiful single crystals by using the chemical vapor transport technique recently developed. So if you look at the STM uh, topographic data, you can even very hard to find any defects. And you have a very small concentration of defects. So what you can do is, for example, the uh, quasi-particle interference by using STM technique. So this is the data by, uh, taken at Riken by Hanaguri Sans group. And by using two different uh, you know, uh, scan directions, you can actually ha have the um, electronic, like electron-like ferrum surface like this, and the hole-like ferrum surface like this. And so you can actually uh, quantify the uh, you know, effective Fermi energies of these uh, two bands. And this uh, technique has a very high energy resolution, so you can have this uh, number. And at the same time, you can uh, take a look at the uh, energy gap by the same technique without uh, uh, you know, uh, applying magnetic field. So this data is taken at 12 tesla to, compress, to suppress the superconductivity to see the, uh, the band uh, electron, electron and the whole band like this. So from these measurements, we can quantify this ratio, delta over EF, which is actually very close to unity for the electron band here. And we get the number like 0 0.3 for the whole band, uh, which is here. So in both cases, these numbers are very large compared to uh, other superconductors. So uh, we can say that we are in the VCSVC -VC crossover regime. And we can do another test, which is the KF Xi. And KF can be you know, uh, simply uh, quantified by looking at this Q over 2. And uh, uh, in-plane coherence length can be uh, quantified by the uh, HC2 measurements. So we get the number KF Xi, which is this kind of uh, numbers. So again, this is consistent with the uh, BCS-BC crossover regime. So we can safely say that this material, iron serenite, is located deep inside this uh, VCSPC crossover regime. And then what is quite important in this uh, phase diagram is that we have another kind of temperature scale other than TC, which is actually a pairing temperature. So we have an extended temperature re regime between the pairing temperature and the actual TC where you have a so-called preformed uh, Cooper pairs, or you may have uh, the, so the so-called pseudo gap. So, the, uh, so first we want to look at the, what is the superconducting fluctuations in this system. And we have evidence for very large superconducting fluctuations. So this is, for example, diamagnetic response. We have a temperature dependence of the magnetization and this is the diamagnetic component. And you can see it starts from fairly high temperature than TC, which is about 9 Kelvin. And here is the uh, resistivity curve. And if you look carefully, you can see uh, you know, downturn curvature starting at around 20 Kelvin, which is here. And you can see the derivative, uh, the rho dt, shows an upturn like this. 
But it is quite difficult to quantify this uh, superconducting fluctuation from only from this uh, data. So we decided to look at uh, the magnetic torque. And the, because that uh, we can actually measure magnetic torque uh, in a very high sensitive uh, way uh, by using the so-called uh, micro cantilever technique like this. And we can have a sensitivity much higher than the commercial squid micrometer, uh, magnetometer. And essentially what we are doing is that we scan the magnetic field uh, like this from the C axis and measure the angular dependence of the magnetic torque. So we see this kind of sine curves like this. And the uh, torque is given by this formula, of course. And uh, in this kind of setup, the, uh, the amplitude of this torque curve is proportional to the uh, difference between the uh, C-axis susceptibility and A-axis susceptibility. So we can quantify this delta chi uh, in a very uh, high resolution. So this is the temperature dependence of delta chi and as you expected, we see some anomaly at structural phase transition or nematic phase transition at TS. Now, we can do this kind of measurements at different fields. So this is a, a set of data showing the temperature dependence of the magnitude of delta chi, which is the difference between C, chi C and chi A. And as you can see, Below some temperature, we see a very strong uh, field dependence. And this field dependence of delta chi is coming from the uh, diamagnetic susceptibility due to the superconducting fluctuations. So we can quantify this number as a function of temperature by subtracting high field data and these are the data for uh, 0.5 and 1 tesla, which can be compared with the uh, theoretical prediction of superconducting fluctuations in a conventional uh, mechanism, meaning that it's a Asura mass of Larkin type Gaussian uh, fluctuations, which is given by this formula. So this uh, theory prediction is for the zero field limit and we can kind of calculate the, the, this uh, delta chi AL as a function of temperature, which is shown by this uh, blue curve. And as you can see, uh, we have a, a kind of tendency that uh, if you go to a lower field, this magnitude becomes uh, larger and larger. And even for the 0 0.5 tesla, uh, we have a strongly enhancement strong enhancement from the, this uh, theoretical prediction in the zero field limit. So from this, we conclude that we have observed uh, giant superconducting fluctuations in the iron selenium up to uh, T, T star, which is of the order of 20 Kelvin, uh, which is actually twice high uh, than, than the t actual Tc. So this giant superconducting fluctuations can be considered as a signature of vcs vc crossover. Uh, and the recent theory paper also concluded that this is actually the uh, signature of vcs vc crossover. Yes? Yes. So you're saying that uh, uh, is the quantitative values much larger than the mass of Larkin prediction, yes, yes, okay? Yes. But the temperature dependence is also different. Or do you, did you check if the temperature dependence is still square root of T minus Tc or not? Okay, so because of the, you know, uh, large error bars, it's kind of difficult to <coughs> distinguish. But within the error bar, you can actually fit. If you, you know, have a, yeah, but so the discrepancy is due to the fact that you can estimate xi from upper critical right, field, yeah. and then the prefactor that you get is much larger than yes, what you expect. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so 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 far so good. I mean, this uh, experiment is consistent with VCS VC crossover. Then we pose a question: What about the uh, specific heat 
because this is the you know most the simplest uh, thermodynamic quantity, and uh, in the case of uh, BCS, we have a very simple kind of temperature dependence of a, of C over T, for example, and we have uh, actually jump at TC. Of course, we have a second of the phase transition, and uh, the temperature dependence in the superconducting state depends on the structure of the superconducting gap. But if you have a, a you know, conventional S-wave superconductor, you, you will see this exponential decay. However, in the case of BEC, the, the, the temperature dependence of the specific heat looks completely different. And this is the simplest case for 3D Bose gas for BEC. And if you look at C over T as a function of T, you, uh, you actually have the uh, gradual increase of C over T towards TC, and you don't have a jump, but you have a kink, right? So it's not like a typical second order phase transition. And then in the superconducting state, you have a power law dependence. And uh, uh, in the, this simplest case, you, you, you will get the square root T dependence of C over T. So we have decided to look at this specific heat very carefully. So we developed the uh, high resolution uh, setup for the specific heat measurement for particularly uh, you know, uh, designed for measuring the small samples. So we actually use this thermometer uh, uh, as a, a heater as well. And uh, we have a grass fiber here to see the uh, what's the change of the temperature if you make a pulse uh, of the heat. And we record the, uh, this uh, increase and the decreasing branches. And then we can actually obtain the specific heat as a function of temperature. Yes? Well, th for example, uh, OK. This one. Yeah, this is just, yeah, so this is the simplest one, okay. So I'm not saying, the, you know, yes, okay. So the uh, advantage of this kind of new, this new setup is that we can reduce the so-called addenda uh, component, which is the background contribution of the uh, sample holder. And for example, if you use a typical PPMS, you know, which is a commercial uh, kind of, uh, measurement setup, you get a very large uh, kind of uh, you know, background contribution. So, but we can actually reduce by a factor of uh, like uh, 1,000. And then uh, we can actually measure very precisely the temperature dependence of small single crystals with a mass of 10 to the 10 or 100 micrograms. And this is a kind of typical example for measured for uh, uh, iron selenium. So we kind of subtracted the phonon term to extract the uh, electronic contribution CE over T as a function of temperature. So we use this uh, 81 microgram sample for this typical measurements, uh, which can be compared with other previously published papers. And here you can actually see a uh, you know, essentially consistent results. And as you can see, uh, we see a, you know, clear jump at TC, and we see a kind of T-linear behavior in the low temperature limit. And this T-linear behavior is considered as evidence for the uh, nodal-like superconducting gap in this system, or very small gap minima, and, but the, the fact that we see a clear jump at TC is more consistent with the BCS-like uh, state in this material. So what's happening here? So one important contribution from theory side is given by the paper by our chairman. And they considered actually two-band system. Of course, iron selenium is the uh, much band uh, superconductor, so you should consider this anyways. But so far, BCS-BC crossover physics has been only considered 
for a single band system, particularly focusing on the ultra-cold atomic systems. And for example, if you have a, a one electron band shown by red dashed curve in the normal state, then if you put the large delta over EF ratio, then you get the BEC-like state. And in the superconducting state, you should see this kind of uh, band structure. And the minimum gap opens at k equals 0, of course. <coughs> However, uh, they actually considered two bands, one whole band and one electron band like this. And then they put strong interband interactions between these two. Of course, you can expect that in iron selenium. Then what they found is that at least one of the band has this kind of VCS-like uh, electronic structure in the superconducting state, even if you have a large delta over EF uh, values. So this suggests that uh, uh, you know, the March band effect complicates the physics of vcs vc crossover. And our results of, of specific heat may be, be, be explained by this kind of uh, March band effect for iron selenium. So we uh, actually further continue our research to this uh, sulfur substituted system. So this is the uh, isoelectronic substitutions. And uh, we can uh, obtain uh, you know, high quality single crystals up to like 20% uh, of sulfur content. And this is the temperature dependence of resistivity. And as you can see, we, sh we can see the anomalies associated with the pneumatic transition. And the transition temperature is shifting down as you increase the sulfur content. And this is a phase diagram we obtained from this kind of measurements. And the structural transition goes down, and it disappears at about 17%. Now, uh, if you look at the STM, uh, then you can actually uh, see some uh, features associated with the sulfur uh, position. And uh, you can actually count the number of sulfur atoms in this, uh, in this area. And it, this is a wider field of view. And uh, you can actually see that there is no evidence for any segre segregations in this kind of uh, high, su high substitution concentration uh, samples. Also, we can observe the uh, quantum oscillations up to a very large number of x, meaning that we can actually have a very clean crystals, clean and homogeneous. So this means that this is a very good system to kind of study the intrinsic physics. And then the question is, what's going on about the bcs bc crossover in this uh, sulfur substituted systems. So let's uh, look at the specific heat uh, as a function of temperature at different composition. So this is again the iron selenium, so you have seen already. So we see a clear jump at Tc for iron selenium. So if you go to 10% uh, uh, sulfur substitution, here you, you get uh, pneumatic temperature about 70 Kelvin, so you are still deep in the pneumatic phase. <coughs> then you see, again, a clear jump at Tc in the C over T as a function of T. And uh, you also see a T linear-like behavior in the low temperature limit. <coughs> now, what is surprising is that if you go to 20%, which is outside the pneumatic phase. So we are actually in the tetragonal phase. Then this C over T look completely different. So as you can see, this is going up gradually. And we have no jump at TC. And we have a kink. And below TC, we have this kind of convex curvature like this, so which is more like power law. So this. Uh, absence of the uh, clear jump at TC is not consistent with BCS-like BC, state. 
Uh, so, and it's more consistent with the BEC-like uh, kind of features I, as I show you. So first thing, uh, I'm an experimentalist. So first thing I was worried is that maybe, you know, we should check the TC distribution, first of all, in this particular sample. As I mentioned, we, uh, we have the uh, very, you know, clean and homogeneous samples. So it is unlikely that this comes from the TC distribution, first of all. And we use the tiny crystals and we made this setup for the uh, tiny crystals measurements. However, there is a chance that uh, we may have a TC distribution. So what we have done is that we actually looked at the, right at the, this uh, critical concentration around 16%. Uh, and here, uh, surprisingly, we see a kind of double transition like this, okay? And one transition is at around eight Kelvin, and the other is at four Kelvin, okay? So, uh, you know, even if we have a very clean and homogeneous sample, we have a, you know, finite size of the crystal, so we may see uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, chemical inhomogeneity that is inevitable, right? But uh, the, what we found is that these two transitions can be re reproduced by using two different data sets. One is that uh, uh, specific heat at 13% percent, which is deep inside the nematic phase. And another is the 20% data, which is outside the nematic phase. Then if you actually add these two, uh, then you can essentially reproduce the, the, the data at 16%. Okay, so this uh, strongly suggests that we have a kind of a rapid jump in TC as a function of uh, X, like this. And in the tetragonal phase, we have a kind of flat uh, X dependence of TC. And in the uh, nematic phase, we also have a, a, a essentially X independent TC like this. So you have a jump. So this means that uh, uh, this kind of uh, gradual increase cannot be attributed to the TC distribution because in the uh, tetragonal phase, we have a fairly constant TC as a function of X. So we believe that this is intrinsic feature of this uh, material. And as I said, in the superconducting state, we have a power law dependence, uh, at least down to uh, uh, below one Kelvin, which we can measure in this technique. And we get like a, a square root T dependence. And this is kind of surprisingly similar what is expected in the BEC uh, case in the simplest 3D Bose gas without any interactions. So I'm not saying that uh, we are in this kind of state, but uh, it is surprising that it's uh, an experimental fact that we see this kind of anomalous temperature dependence of the specific heat. So this is again the comparison between the uh, uh, iron selenium results in the nematic phase and this is 20% uh, sulfur doped sample in the tetragonal phase. You see a clear difference between these two. Now we can also take a look at the tunneling conductance curve at different composition. So this is a, a you know, sulfur content and the blue curves are in the nematic phase and the red curves are in the tetragonal phase. And as you can see, they, uh, they look quite different between these two phases. And in the nematic phase, you see a clear kind of, uh, clear quasi-particle peaks, yep. But in the tetragonal phase, this is strongly damped. And it's not clear from this figure, but in the tetragonal phase, we see a finite uh, zero energy density of states, very large one, uh, which is present. And this uh, finite zero energy state is quite consistent 
is this specific heat data because this uh, measurement has been taken at uh, 0 0.445 Kelvin, which is about here. And in the specific heat, we, sh we see a uh, you know, very large density of states, even at this kind of low temperature. So this, in this sense, these two measurements uh, show uh, uh, you know, quite consistent picture. And we believe that we have obtained the thermodynamic evidence for possible BEC-like state in tetragonal iron selenium sulfur. And this is quite amazing because uh, there is no any solids so far to have this kind of BEC-like state. Only uh, ultra-cold atomic systems can talk about BEC so far. So if this is correct, it's, it's like a revolution in the solid state physics. So we can also take a look at the torque magnetometry in uh, the 20% sample. And we did, we did a similar analysis as iron selenium. And again, we got a large enhancement of this delta chi uh, below T star, which is about 20 Kelvin again. But you know, you should know that, that uh, you know, temperature scale and the field scale should be uh, quite different between these two systems because here we have Tc as about nine Kelvin, but here we have Tc as four Kelvin. And uh, so associated HC2 is also suppressed compared with this. So you know, we see a large enhancement even at one tesla. Uh, this means that uh, you know, the um, superconducting fluctuations are more pronounced in sulfur dot and tetragonal phase. <coughs> now I have asked, I, I, I asked the uh, Professor Shin's group to look at the laser RFS measurement in this system. And here is a set of data taken at the two Kelvin. Okay, two Kelvin. And uh, here is the orthorhombic phase, and here is the tetragonal phase. And as you can see, in all of these systems, they see a quite flat band like this, and uh, which is consistent with the uh, vicinity of VCSVC crossover regime. But if you look at carefully, the, the, this, if you zoom up this part, then you can have a, a convex down curvature in the orthorhombic phase, but if you have a convex up curvature in the tetragonal phase. So this is again consistent with the VEC-like state in this tetragonal side. Now the question is, uh, what about delta over EF? Then uh, from quantum oscillation measurements, we can uh, look at the size of the Fermi surface, which is related to the uh, Fermi energy. And most of the band shows an increasing trend of the frequency, which, which means that the EF is going up in energy if you go to the tetragonal side. And at the same time, the energy gap is shrinking if you go to the tetragonal side. So this means that the delta over EF is actually smaller in the tetragonal phase. So this is kind of opposite to what you expect in the BEC case. So the conclusion is that the, the observed BEC-like state in tetragonal side is quite unexpected. So I think that we should think about another key parameter that determines the BEC-SBEC crossover uh, in this kind of March band case. So this is the final kind of uh, slides. And uh, I talked to Ilya Eremin and who kind of suggested the importance of the uh, two-band effect, and he considered, again, that this kind of two-band system, as uh, Professor Chubkov did, and they considered the inter-band interaction and also the intra-band interactions. And what they found is that if you change the, uh, the ratio between the intra-band versus inter-band interactions, then uh, if you have a, you know, more stronger interband interactions, you uh, actually get uh, BCS-like state. So this is a calculation of uh, pairing temperature and uh, Tc. 
But if you increase the intraband interactions, then you get uh, uh, kind of deviations between these two, meaning that you uh, you likely to have the uh, BEC-like state. So this suggests that uh, you actually the the another parameter is this. Uh, ratio between the intraband and the interband interactions. So that I think the time is up, so I can go come to the conclusion that the, uh, so we have studied the uh, kind of thermodynamic study <coughs> of this species, SBEC crossover in this iron selenium sulfur superconductors. So we have obtained a clean and homogeneous single crystals and we observe the unexpected BEC-like behaviors in this tetragonal site, which has a smaller delta over EF. And uh, so, you know, this is still, we have several open questions, but uh, one possible scenario is that uh, maybe interband versus intraband interactions, the ratio between these two may be an important uh, parameter to describe this system. And finally, this is a very good uh, bulk system for studying multi band BCS BC crossover in any solids. Thank you very much for your Thank attention. You. Okay, great. Questions and comments?